Hello, church. Good morning. Uh, I'm over here, by the way. My name is Joel, and I'm one of the pastors here. I'd like to welcome you guys as we've come together to meet with God today. We believe that God is here, and He is present. He is active, and He wants us to engage with Him. He wants to reveal Himself to us. And we're going to open up our time by singing, as we often do, uh, singing a song called All Creation, Lift Your Voice. And we're reminded as we sing this song that all of creation proclaims God's handiwork, the scripture says. Jesus tells us that if we didn't praise him, even the rocks would cry out and praise him. And so everything has been made by God, and he is worthy and deserving of our worship and our song. So let's get up on our feet and let's praise him this morning.
As we sing this next song, we're reminded that we unite our voices with all the Christians across the globe and all the Christians who have come before us and all the Christians who will come after us. This song is rooted in the Apostles' Creed, which is really just the most basic teaching of the church. And so as you proclaim these words, I just want to encourage you that as you are you're speaking out this truth, you're speaking it with uh, Christians from all throughout history and all throughout the world. Holy Church, I believe in the resurrection. 
Good morning. So as a worship community, especially in the light of the recent tragedy in Buffalo, New York, we have the opportunity this morning to rehearse the effects of the fall. And perhaps your heart is as broken and tearful as mine. Um, our teacher, Pastor Harvey, says he's gonna give us an opportunity to claim hope. We want to be reminded of two things. One, our need for redeeming grace, our need for untainted holiness in Jesus Christ. In just a moment, you are invited to read statements of grief, which can lead hearts towards repentance. As you pray together this lament, you may want to ask the Holy Spirit to also pray for yourself, as well as our Trinity community. So please join me and self-reflect and as we read out loud the following lament. O oh Lord, our God, in your mercy and kindness, no thought of ours is left unnoticed, no desire or concern ignored. You have proven that blessings abound when we fall on our knees in repentance, and so we turn to you in our depravity, our shallowness, our fear. Surrounded by brokenness and cries for justice, we hear your voice telling us what is required only to do justice and to love goodness and to walk humbly with your God, Micah 6.8. Fill us with your mercy that we, in turn, may be merciful to others. S strip away our pride and our suspicion. Make destitute our comfort and bring to shame our division so that we may seek peace, justice, and unity with your people and your world. Strengthen our hearts so that they may be only to the rhythm of your holy will. Amen.
that prayer and we move on in our service, we're reminded of the death of Jesus on our behalf. The scripture says that it is the blood of Jesus that reconciles us to God and reconciles us to one another. And it makes us into one new humanity. And we're going to have an opportunity now for those of you who are Christians who've repented of your sin and trusted in Jesus as your Savior to come forward and receive a communion, which is really a symbol of that unity. It's Jesus' body symbolized in the cracker that's broken on the cross for our sins. It's Jesus' blood represented in the juice shed for the forgiveness of our sins and ultimately, as I said, the unity of the church. And if, if you're a Christian, uh, you'll be welcome to come forward in just a second and receive that and just be reminded of that truth, that God is making humanity into one, into Jesus, into Jesus Christ. And as you come forward and do that, you're also invited to continue to sing with us and celebrate what God has done.
Shout to God. Let's praise him. Amen. Amen. One of those of you who are seated, join us again and stand as we sing this last song before uh, the word gets open. I encourage you to sing this song as your personal prayer to God. The king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow. we just profess that truth. You are good through thick and through thin, through joy and sorrow. You are good. And you're never going to let us down because, God, you are a faithful God. And so we praise you. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down.
us out with a clap and a shout, praising Him. God, we praise You. You are good, Lord. You are good. You are good. You can all grab your seats now. Good morning. My name is Greg, and I'm one of the elders of the church here. And I have to apologize. I forgot about half of my props for what I'm going to do right now. Um, but on Thursday, I got to hold a sign like this, wearing a black suit and sunglasses, in the Seattle airport because the Carklins family, who's um, um, the, their, their husband of that is um, the lead pastor of Mavieta Church, a sister church for us, their family has made it here for their sabbatical. And so I want to introduce them to you. And so, Carlton family, you come on up. And as they're coming up, um, my daughter asked a great question this morning, and I thought it'd be good to answer it. Is she asked, Daddy, what's the difference between a long vacation and a sabbatical? <laughs> and um, it forced me to think of it. Oh, I need to answer that this morning. And so the best answer I came up with this morning was... Um, the main difference is there's a part of it where you're stopping and considering, hmm, what would more health look like when I step back into ministry? And so um, that's what the Kirklands are here to do. And we just wanted to let them introduce themselves and share a little bit about what's going on. So, Carlos, would you introduce your family to us? Yeah. And thank God you hold that notice because we would not recognize you in that airport. <laughs> um, yes, my name is Carlos. Uh, this is my wife, Rute. And our youngest, Ronya, and our uh, other two older, uh, Katrin, who is five, and Jacobs, who is nine, they're downstairs in the Sunday school enjoying themselves. Uh, so that's us. So two questions to start with. How long are you going to be here? And then what are you hoping for during the sabbatical? Uh, we'll be here till the end of July, so we got some time. Uh, and hopefully that nice weather is coming up soon. Uh, that's what our plan is. Uh, but our plan is really to kind of be away from, uh, from all the daily duties that we had back in Latvia. And, you know, the time zone difference really helps for that. Nobody is trying to reach us out for us. And uh, we just want to enjoy um, the nature, hike, meet uh, our friends and meet new friends. And just spend some time kind of uh, recovering, refreshing and um, maybe, yeah, just getting some new habits or daily, uh, weekly rhythms that we could uh, transfer into as we go back uh, into ministry in September. And then one last question is, obviously those things you just mentioned are things that we can be praying for you. Um, are there any other things that we can be praying for your family as you're here in the United States? Um, yeah, I think the main, main thing is that... We've experienced already during this week since we left home uh, that God has really blessed us and guided uh, us and, and showed his grace and mercy, al although we don't deserve it. But our prayer is that he continues to reveal himself. Um, for me personally, it's more, uh, you know, a lot of things that I do in church uh, are spiritual. And so it, it kind of it blends together. My faith blends together with my work. And my hope is that uh, uh, during this time it gets separated again. Um, and uh, we as a family can grow in, uh, in uh, relationships with God and our faith, but also in relationships with, with each other and, and kind of disciple each other during this time. Yeah, so they're going to be just effectively members of our church, not really members, but just regular attenders of our church. They're going to be a part of the community group that my wife and I are a part of. Um, so feel free to reach out to them and say hi. If you already know them, of course, you know, you know it'd be good to catch up with them. And uh, they'll be around. And so um, you get to enjoy the blessing that I've got to have of having them around. And then let me pray for your family. And then uh, we'll go on with the service. Father God, thank you so much for the Carklands family. And uh, your provision for them to get them here uh, through all the trials with COVID and documentation and all of that. Father, I do pray that this summer would be a summer of rest and recovery. And Lord, that at the end of this summer, Lord, that they would be so excited to go back to Latvia and do the ministry that you've put on, on their plates. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, I want to introduce our guest speaker today uh, is Pastor Harvey Drake. 
Um, he is the senior pastor of Emerald City Bible Church. He's also the president of Urban Impact, uh, which is a nonprofit there in the Rainier Valley, breaking the cycle of social, material, and spiritual poverty. Uh, he's been ministering and serving the community of uh, Rainier Valley for over th of 35 years. Um, he's also uh, been married to Andrea for 45 years. Uh, he's got two adult sons, but I, don't, I can't figure out the math because he looks like he's 40, right? Um, so, but anyways, I'm going to invite Pastor Harvey Drake to come up here uh, and minister to us with the gospel and the word of God. Join me in welcoming Well, good morning, good morning. I'll do the math for you. My wife and I were uh, married in utero. Her mom and dad were friends with my mom and dad who said they're going to be married. So that, that explains that, right? <laughs> it's good to be here with you today. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I love your pastor. What's his name, Jonah? Nobody's laughing back there. Usher, can you put them out, please? <laughs> when I tell a joke, you must laugh, amen, whether you like it or not. Yeah. No, I do. I love your pastor, Joel. We've uh, been hanging out with each other for a little while now, and um, it's good to find people of like heart and mind, people who really desire God's will to be done in earth as it is in heaven. And so for me, he is one of those individuals, amen? Yeah. And so I want you guys to take really good care of him. Pray for him more than you criticize him or ask those deep questions of him. Amen? I'm sure you will. At least this side will. Nobody will be even grunted. <laughs> well, I think uh, they told me that I had until 12.30 to uh, preach today. Uh, don't worry. I brought my lunch with me, so I'll be all right. No, it is indeed a pleasure to uh, be here. Uh, in light of all that happened this uh, yesterday there in Buffalo, I was telling the group earlier that I am hopeful it's another sign that we have an opportunity to help change things in our nation. Amen. And uh, when we begin to talk about these things, I trust that we will have the kinds of conversations that will begin to move us closer together and not further apart. In fact, if the conversation that's happening is not pulling us together, it's the wrong conversation. No, the whole room should have said amen. Amen. Because we know that there is a sect in our culture that's trying to keep us divided. When God has been, has been for a while now trying to bring us together, amen? amen? And so we're just grateful for the Lord. Well, well, let me just tell you a quick, quick story, then I'll pray. <clears throat> so one day a man was talking to his friend, and they, they were discussing Bible things, things, and he said to his friend, it doesn't seem like you know very much Bible. He said, no, 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 I, I know a lot of Bible. He said, no, I don't, I don't think you do. He said, I bet you can't even recite the Lord's Prayer. His friend said, okay, I'll take you up on that bet. If, if, that bet, he said, in fact, I tell you what, if you can recite the Lord's Prayer, I'll give you, no, not $10, I'll give you $20. So he said, okay, let me hear it. He says, okay. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. His friend started to laugh. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Reached in his pocket, pulled out the $20, handed it to his friend and said, I didn't think you knew it. <laughs> Did not think you knew it. Amen. Oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm sorry. Let me apologize. You're never supposed to tell a joke that's not connected to your sermon. But I just did, amen? But I do, I do like to, let, let me just pray. And if I'm allowed to, let me sing a prayer that I, that I pray often. It simply says, let your love come fill this place. Lord, we need your sweet embrace, amen? I hope I get it in C sharp because that's my best key for this song. Let your love come fill this place. Let your love come fill this place. Lord, we need your sweet embrace. Let your love come fill this place. 
Let your peace come fill this place. Let your peace come fill this place. Lord, we need your sweet embrace. Let your peace come fill this place. This time, put your hand over your heart. Because this is the place I'm talking about right here. Amen. We want God to fill this room, but more than anything else, we need to be filled. Let your joy come fill this place. Let your joy come fill this place. Lord, we need your sweet embrace. Let your joy come fill this place. This is my favorite one. Let your power, God, fill this place. Let your power, God, fill this place. Lord, we need your sweet embrace. Let your power come fill this place. The church say amen. 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 I want to bring to you a sermon today that's simply titled, The Church in Society. The Church in Society, and I hope today when you leave, I will convince you that the church is to be the conscious of our society and our culture. We are to lead the culture and not cower to the culture or follow the culture. Amen? Amen. Amen. God is the orchestrator of all things. We have been called to be a part of his plan to redeem this world, and I don't care how broken this world is, God still loves it, amen, and wants to see it redeemed, and he has invited us to be a part of his plan to redeem this world. So we want to lead culture and not cower. If I'm honest, I'm I'm concerned that the church, devoted followers of Jesus, have too long abdicated its role, and as a result, we have become comfortable with what is going on in the culture, even though we know it does not fit God's plan. Amen? Okay, so this is what I want. That's, that's what you'll walk away with. Amen? If you don't remember anything else, just remember, oh, we're supposed to be the conscious of culture and society, and we should be leading change, not cowering to the prevailing culture. Amen? So every year, what do we do in January? We make New Year's resolutions, yes. Every year in January, what else do we do? We, we get gym memberships. Every year in January, what do we do? We celebrate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., don't we? How many of you have uh, uh, jobs where they let you have the day off? Oh, yeah. Oh, seeing me, I need to talk to your employers if you're not getting the day off, right? The government and many businesses recognize the day and they give the employees a day off. Many schools do the same and they close down and nobody has to, to do a thing. But how often do they talk about the legacy of his spiritual life? They talk about him, him being a great orator. We all love his I, I have a dream speech. Amen. We talk about him being a great civil rights leader, but how many of them, businesses and schools, actually talk about his spiritual legacy, the thing that actually inspired him? It inspired him to do what he did. Amen. But will they teach him about his Christian faith, which motivated him, guided his campaigns for justice? I don't think so. But I love this about him. At the end of the boycott that he led in, I think it was uh, Birmingham, I think it was. He started what they call the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Anybody heard of the SLC? Southern Leadership Christian Conference. And when he finished the campaign, most of his trusted advisors wanted him to drop the name Christian because they thought that the, the liberal whites from the north would not support their effort. But he was adamant about that and would never drop the word. So Christian remained in the title. He also insisted that everybody who participated with him in the various marches would would do a number of things. 
They would pray before every march. They would read the gospel of Jesus Christ weekly. That they would be committed to living a life of justice and righteousness so that people would see that they were emulating the life of Christ. And I believe that the reason he had so much so much uh, support was that he never repaid evil for evil. Some of us are old enough to remember uh, uh, what they showed on the news and how he was beaten, how he was jailed, how they put the dogs on him, how they put the water hoses, the whole nine. But if you remember, they never repaid evil for evil. Why? Because we overcome evil with good. Somebody say amen. amen. We overcome evil with good. So he insisted. He insisted that they participate and operate out of Christian principles. Now, get this. Remember now, it was not a Christian nation, if you will, right? What was happening to him was not Christian, yet he thought we should operate out of Christian principles. Amen? That's one of the roles of the church is to reflect the heart, the passion, the purview, the will, and the plan of God. Amen. And if you haven't heard that before, you heard it today. Amen? Amen? That's why God called us out of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Amen? Amen. So we see, we see, we see, we see that the missing piece was they left out the fact that he was a Christian. Slide four. So I can imagine Reverend King holding the scripture in one hand, holding the culture in the other hand, and grappling with the incongruence that he saw all around him. In Atlanta, in Birmingham, in Louisiana, in Texas, in Seattle, in Tacoma. I, I see him doing that. He's holding this, and it says we should love one another. We should support one another. We should prefer one another over and above ourselves. And on the other side, we're seeing just the opposite happen. And I begin, he, he began to stand up and say the church must challenge this. Amen? So he was grappling with incongruence. Reverend King had to challenge the culture and civil leaders to change because much, of, much like today, many are ignoring God's truth. Let me read a few things that I think Dr. King read. Psalms 33, 5 said, The Lord loves justice and righteousness. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Psalm 89, 14 Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Psalms 97, 2. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Psalm 117, excuse me, Psalm 111, 7 says, For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. Psalm 103, 6. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Then I can imagine him reading number eight. Isaiah 1, 13 says, Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feast and your appointed feast, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Why? When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening to you. Your hands are full of blood. They're not reflecting my heart, my passion, my will, my desire. Verse 16 says, wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the cause of the widow. And I can imagine that he continued to read his scripture, and he ran across John 8 where it talks about the woman caught in adultery. And they brought this woman, threw him at the foot of Jesus, and said, what are you going to do about this? And the Bible declares that he simply stooped down and began to write in the dirt. And as he began to write in the dirt, the Bible says, that they begin to leave one by one from the oldest to the eldest. What was wrong with that picture? What was wrong with the picture that it was an unjust act because the Bible declared that if you caught somebody in adultery, you're supposed to bring both parties to be stoned. They only brought who? And Jesus had to deal with that. He addressed it. He said, no, 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 no. And so he absolved her of her sin, but he told her, listen, 
They don't continue, neither do I, but go and sin no more. He didn't condone her sin, but he was not going to tolerate injustice. Somebody say amen right there. So, so, so can you see Dr. King reading the scripture and the scripture stirring him? When you read the scripture, is the scripture stirring you? When you read the text, does, does it motivate you? Does it, does it even, does it chide your hide? Is that a, is that, do people still use that phrase? I don't know. I think my grandmother used to say, boy, that's hiding my hide. I, I guess that means it makes her whatever. I don't know. <laughs> but, but, think, but think about this. He's, he's reading the scripture and he's grappling with all the things that are wrong and he's confronting them. Nine says that Dr. King was a prophet. What is a prophet? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Prophet had a special relationship with the Lord. See, the priest stood between us and God and would represent us to God and God to us. But the prophet had, a, had an unusual role because he reflected and represented God. And when the culture was out of place and not functioning the way that it should, guess what? God would send the prophet to address that. Amen? Amen. So God would use the prophet to bring divine revelation. He would bring insight. He would bring this, uh, the, 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 the direction. God would use the prophet to do some incredible, incredible things. And when the king, which represented the authority, got out of line, guess what God did? He, he, even though he told us to obey those who were in leadership, when leadership got out of step, he would send the prophet. And the prophet would say, this is what the Lord says. And we see that clearly in the scripture, amen. David and Bathsheba is one of the clearest examples of that. Uh, Nineveh, uh, Jonah being sent to Nineveh is another example of God speaking to folks who are in leadership. In fact, God was going to destroy that place and he sent Jonah in who was a reluctant prophet. And when he got in and finally gave the word that God had for them, the Bible says that the whole nation repented. And God knows that's what we need today. We need somebody in leadership repenting. For some of the decisions that are being made. The Lord came to Jonah, used Jonah. And God used John the Baptist. Now, now you got to understand that when you, when you stand up and do what is right with God, not everybody's going to like it. How many know it, it can be a little dangerous even, amen? <laughs> it's not easy being a truth teller, right? It's not easy being a truth teller. I'm told that this weekend, folks who were upset about what might happen at the Supreme Court started doing horrible things to churches. So when you, when you decide to do what God wants, when you decide to follow him and honor him and, and obey him, guess what? There might be some pushback. So don't be surprised by it. Amen. In fact, you ought to expect it. Amen? This is what Dr. King did. Before every march, they prayed. Every march, they reminded them of what they might encounter, all right, because they, they, they knew the Bull Connors. They knew who were with them and who weren't, and when they weren't, they said, just, just, just be ready. Just be ready. When it happens, this is how I want you to behave. So we just need to prepare ourselves for it, amen? Stop being afraid and just know it's coming. How many of you say you really want to see Jesus? But I know you don't want to see him today, so put your hand down. I don't want to see him today either because I've got to get to Tokyo. I've got to get to India. I've got to get to Barcelona. <laughs> there are some other places and people that I want to experience before God beams me up. Amen? <laughs> but, I want you to, but I want you to know that when we take this place of really trying to be the voice for God, it's going to, somebody say, cost us. Role of the apostles. I believe that the church is the modern day prophet. I believe that we devoted followers of Jesus ought to be the one that replaced the John the Baptist, the Apostle Paul, the James, the brother of Jesus, and in this day reflect the heart and passion and the will of God. 
So, so let, let me give an example of how this works. So on June 7, 2020, our church, our little church, started praying on the corner of Rainier Avenue and South Henderson Street. We've been out there every Sunday from 1230 to 1:30, praying and asking that God's will would be done on earth. We're asking God to send daddies home to raise their children and nurture their children. We're asking families to be healthy. We're asking that the violence that have overrun our community would be, would be eliminated. We're asking God to touch our civic leaders so that they would have the heart and the mind of God. We're trusting that God will begin to do this. So every Sunday, with the exception of Mother's Day, Mother's Day always eclipses everything else. <laughs> <coughs> And we're, we're out there and we're praying because we believe that we ought to reflect that. And we're out there because we want people to see us. They see our building. We have a gray, uh, gray brick green building on Rainier Avenue, Main Thoroughfare. They see the building. It doesn't look like a church to somebody. Say, that, that don't look like a church to me. Well, it is. But, but we've gotten out because we want them to see. Everybody else is out the closet. I think the church ought to come out as well. And they ought to see us. So we have signs asking God to heal our land, asking God to bring forgiveness. We have signs that asking God to bring peace to people and that we would know that God loves us because the world needs to see a demonstration. Oh, am I getting too loud for them? The baby just said, shh. <laughs> the world needs to see a demonstration of who God is. We've been too quiet, church. We've got to stand up. We don't have to be brash. We don't have to be mean. We don't have to be harsh. We don't have to be ugly. We just need to be clear and direct and simply say, you know what? Enough is enough. And so I stand up at this rally. We did a rally uh, in, in, uh, on, March, on June 7th, and they asked me if I would pray at the rally. I'm going, what? Pray at a rally? And so I got up and prayed. I said, uh, uh, I want you to look at the person on your left and right. Look, you look at somebody now. Do like... Look at them, look at somebody on the other, uh, look. Man, would you look at somebody? <laughs> and, I would, and I would say, repeat after me, say, hey, what's up, family? And I said to them, at what time are we going to stop treating each other like enemies and start treating each other like the family God wants us to be? And then I said to them, if we're honest, what we have done up to this point to try to solve racial issues and ethnic struggles has not worked. Maybe it's time to give God's way a chance. And some of the folks started clapping. But I wanted to plant that seed. Because at some point, we've got to be honest and say what we've tried ourselves is not working. Why? Because this issue is a spiritual issue. They have social connotations. But guess what? It's a spiritual issue. And you cannot solve spiritual issues through social means. That's what we've been doing all this time. We have more people who are homeless than they started 10 years ago. They're going to eradicate homelessness. We have more homeless people today than they did 10, 10 years ago. And now they want to just give more money to it. Money is not the issue or the problem. It's the lack of wholesome, authentic relationships. But they don't want to deal with that part. That's too hard for them, amen? It's easy just to put money into it. But let me say, the church has a role to play, amen? Here we go. Uh, number 11. Number 11. So who has the responsibility to be the conscience of society? Who has the responsibility to model, if you will, <coughs> God's perspective? Who, who has the responsibility to be bearers of God's sense of justice? And this is important when we talk about justice. I want to talk about it from a biblical perspective. Because if I take it from a human perspective, guess what? Then I determine what is just and what isn't just. And what I say may be based on my preferences or on my peculiarities, right? What, but if we look at God's vantage, from God's vantage point, we will discover that God has a sense of what justice is. And that's what we need to strive for. Up to this point, it's just been all about what we want, what we think is just. And as a result, we have chaos. Somebody's got to stand up and say, maybe we ought to rethink this thing. When we're standing at the water cooler and we're having those conversations and we're fussing about this president and that president and this Congress, and we should fuss about Congress. In fact, I say withhold their pay till they get something done. <laughs> Come on. 
Amen. Withhold that pay till they get solve some problems. Man, they're getting a big old fat paycheck, a better health care program than any of us, and they get a long-term pension too. Y'all better get something done in Washington. But, but, but who has the responsibility to be the conscience of society, the bearers and models of godly justice and bearers of God's perspective? We do. And it's okay. We need, to, we need to get people to think about that again. Stop being afraid. Stop allowing people to embarrass you. Oh, I don't want to be an evangelical. Yes, I do. I am an evangelical. I believe that Jesus Christ was born, he died, and guess what? He rose again. And guess what? He's coming back again. I believe that. So I'm not going to let somebody who, who have done something that's off Make me ashamed of being a devoted follower of Jesus. Come on, church. This is a good point just to muse. What, what, what am I embarrassed by? What am I afraid of? What groups will I not declare that I'm a devoted follower? When, when I go to civic meetings, I sit in that meeting, I pray, God, what's your word for this meeting? Because I believe when I'm sitting across from the mayor, or county prosecutor, or anybody else in leadership, Seattle Police Department, whomever it is, I'm asking God, what's your word for this meeting? God, what do you want to accomplish here? And I'm starting to take advantage of the opportunity that I have just to ask questions about what is working, what isn't working. What might we do differently? Which is why, which is why Joel and I are part of a group of pastors who are Grappling with what does it really mean to be the people of God, to be the family of God. And we're having to get, grapple with some real questions because we have to be honest about how our nation has developed, amen? Not so that we can feel bad, but so that we can do better. Here's a quote from Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham Jam. He said, a just law is a man-made code, excuse me, a just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law, however, is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law and therefore has no binding power over human conscience. I agree with that. Just laws connect with what God wants, amen? Unjust laws, they, they can be anywhere. Okay, here, here's a few questions for you, number 12. So are we obligated to follow the laws of the land? Yeah, we are, according to Romans 13. Uh, are we obligated to obey unjust laws, laws that are out of sync or out of step with Scripture? No, everybody should have said no there. Okay, and th this is what we find in Acts chapter 4 when they were out healing, people were being healed in the name of Jesus, and, and, and the religious leaders didn't like it, and the civic leaders didn't like it, and they told them, you guys need to shut up, and how dare you do this again? They said, you be the judge. Should we obey you or obey God? There are times when we have to stand up and say no. There are times we have to stand up and say that's not going to keep happening. There are times where we have to confront some of the systems that are in place that are designed to hinder and to hamper everybody from flourishing. Amen? So let me give you a quick example. My wife is a 28-year, 29-year education vet. She has a doctor degree in education. She was an elementary school principal for 13 years. She is now retired. Seattle School District has the fifth largest achievement gap in the nation, not just the state, between black and white students. You, you think that's right? No. What are we going to do about it besides feel bad about it? I think a group of us need to stand up Lock arms, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, First American, and everybody else, lock arms and go to the school district and say, fix it and fix it now. I moved, into, I moved to Seattle 38 years ago. They were talking about closing the achievement gap then. 38 years later, only 34% of black students in Seattle schools read at grade level. Did you hear me? Read by lips. I know they're small, but they're moving. 34%. Then, we, then they want me to be okay with that. I'm not okay with that. God created us all in his image and in his likeness. God created us all to flourish, amen? And something is happening that's keeping some of my friends, my cousins, my nephew, uh, not my children, because I stood for my children. 
and I stood for many more children, which is why our ministry started. Uh, we've been doing summer schools for over 30 years, helping kids make the grade. We've been helping kids get to college. Uh, we tell them we can't afford to pay for college, but we're going to help you get there. We're going to prepare you for that. We, we dedicated over $150,000 just to help kids get to college, amen, because we believe that something has to be done. And now it's time for all of us to lock hearts and arms together to, to challenge that and many other systemic things that are not working for all people. Are biblical laws relevant today? They are. See, here's a secret. God is still in control. Uh, here's another secret. Uh, 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 we still live in, in an area where God rules and reigns. We just don't act like it. But ultimately, God's will is going to be done, church. And I just want to be a part of that plan, amen? I want God to use me to help turn this thing around. Do we ever have a cause to engage in civil disobedience? Yes, we do. Let me skip that. Because God made the world so he knows how it works best. I drive a Toyota. I'm not taking my car to, car to a Ford dealership for service. Because who knows my car better, Ford or Toyota? God created the world. Who knows his best? God or us? That, that makes sense, right? Okay, let, 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 so, so let me ask again. What's the role of the church? What's the role of devoted followers? What assignment did Jesus give his disciples before he left the earth? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creation, every creature, every person. Amen? And so what I'm trying to help people do is see that it is a privilege to be invited into God's plan. As I said earlier, as crazy as our world is, God loves this world. He wants to see it redeemed. That's why we have not been taken up yet. He's still waiting for us to get in sync with him, in lockstep with him, to be in alignment with him. Amen. And when things in my life are out of alignment, guess what? I have some work to do. I have some prayer to do. I have some changing to do because I want to be in alignment with God. So we have the privilege to persuade people to observe all that God has in mind. I haven't shot up a mall lately. Because I have the mind of Christ. I didn't shoot and kill 10 people at top supermarket in Buffalo yesterday because I have the mind of Christ. I've been married 45 years. Happily married 45 years. Because I have the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ says, do what the woman wants, done. My, 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 kid, my kids are doing okay. They're doing okay because I have the mind of Christ. I love all people, amen. I'm trying to fix our racial issue, not add to it, not complicate it, not make it worse because I have the mind of Christ, amen. The mind of Christ tells me that I'm to prefer you above myself. The sum that does not make sense. But when I see a system that is not working the way God wants it to, I have an opportunity to see what I can do to change that. Does that make sense to anybody but me? I'm trying to close because, boy, I, I can keep going. Whoa, wait, hold, it's almost lunchtime. Hold on. Oh, no, I've got another hour. Oh, here we go. So, so let's look at a few things. Hit, hit slide 14 for me. So when things are out of alignment with God's will, much like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, guess what? We, we got to start speaking up, church. We have to start speaking up. It, it may cost us, but we still have to speak up. So God used people to bring about change. I want you to think about this. Historically, we enslaved people of African descent. That was changed because there were some devoted followers who said that is not in alignment with God's will. 
And so you had abolitionists that stood up and said, no more of that. Amen? Wasn't the Methodists, wasn't the Presbyterians, wasn't the Episcopals, wasn't the Baptists. They all wanted to keep their slaves. But there were some devoted people who said, enough is enough. And guess what? That ended. Then they came up with these things called the Jim Crow laws that were designed to keep people down. My dad, if he were alive, he'd be, what, 95, 96 <coughs> this year. <clears throat> he served in the U.S. military. And when he and his white counterpart would, were in the South and they would go to a restaurant, his counterpart, white guy, would go through what door? He would have to go through what door? The back door. Okay? They had these separate water fountains, one for whites, one for blacks. They had separate schools, amen? Separate but equal, right? And, and somebody had to speak to bring an end to that madness. Devoted followers did that. There were Christians who stood up and said, no more. And Dr. King was right on the, right on the outer edge of that in the 50s and 60s, Amen? So, so, so God's people were used to bring about change. They ended legal enslavement of people. They ended Jim Crow. Uh, in fact, Dr. King was so effective that two of the most powerful pieces of legislation in our history were the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act that were enacted in the 64 and 65. My father was 40 years old before he could vote which meant that his parents were sick in their 60s before they could vote. And if his grandparents were alive, that means they were in their 80s before they can vote for the first time. But because a devoted follower and others banded together, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, you name it, they were all coming together around this issue, it got changed, amen? And now it's our time to end bigotry of low expectations. I am tired of going to a school where they don't think the black kids can learn. I'm tired of the place where they don't think black, black parents can take care of their children. So, oh, we just have, no, don't coddle me. Give me the tools I need to be effective, amen? amen. Judge people by the content of their character. We need equality in education, equality in pay, and we need fair judicial laws. Lord, have mercy. But devoted followers are going to be instrumental in changing that, but we're going to have to speak up. Am I making anybody else mad besides me? <laughs> See, I thought this dude was going to bring a happy message today. I am happy because I'm getting to share the word of God with you. Amen. Listen to a couple quotes. Edmund Burke, all tyranny needs to gain a foothold is for people of good conscience to remain silent. Here's another one. Nobody made a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could only do little. So don't ever think the little you do doesn't count, amen? M.L. King says, the ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence over that by the good people. God uses good people, godly people, to bring about change. Uh, we, I told you we were, we've been praying on this corner Every Sunday since June 7, 2020, we will continue to do that. <clears throat> so uh, a year ago, March, there was a young man, uh, a black man, was killed in, my in our sanctuary by another black man, by the way. And BLM didn't call me, didn't text me, didn't email me, didn't send me flowers, never said a word. But you let a white man kill me, they want to tear everything up. There's some hypocrisy in that. So this young man was killed, and so the insurance company naturally have to make sure we're covered. So they sent a, an investigator down to talk to the staff who happened to be there when it occurred. Come to find out the investigator happened to be a former police officer, a white gentleman. And uh, he also happened to be a devoted follower of Jesus. So in the process of talking, I mentioned to him that we had been out on Rainer Avenue and South Henderson praying every Sunday since June 7, 2020 said, really? I said, yeah, because we're trusting God's going to break down the strongholds, baby. And showed him the sign. And so one Sunday, he shows up at our service. He said, oh, God, God told me to come down and come and go pray with you. I said, what? <laughs> so so, so he, he came to the corner with us, and we began to pray. 
<clears throat> when it was over, he said, I got to tell you something. I believe God gave me a message for you all. He said, I know you guys have been out here for a while. At times, it may feel like nothing's happening. He said, but God told me to tell you to be sure, let you know that things would be much worse if you were not out here. So the little things that we do can make, somebody said, make a difference. The ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence over the bad by the good people. And I believe this is an opportunity for us to stand up. So George Floyd was killed, and it was really tragic. It was right after Ahmed Arbery was, uh, was killed. And Ahmed Arbery was the black gentleman jogging through a neighborhood, and the, two, the father and the son tracked him down and killed him. Why would you video something like that? And when that happened, <clears throat> when that happened, I got a call from some friends, and I saw a Facebook post, and the Facebook post, oh, I'm sorry, just so sorry. Again, white brothers, just so sorry. <clears throat> so I, put, I, I, I responded to the Facebook post and said, we don't need sympathy, man. We need change. And so the president of uh, Northwest University said, well, can I get your number? So I sent it to him, and he called me right away, and I talked to him about why we need change and what the role of the church could be and how we needed to band together to bring about this change. And as a result, uh, there was a two-page ad taken out in the Seattle Times. You may remember that, uh, May 20. <clears throat> and over 200 white pastors and other pastors signed that letter. We, we, we could have gotten more signatures, but, you know, we had already spent a lot of money on the ad for two pages. And we had the ad placed in two African-American-owned papers as well because we wanted the community to see that the church was feeling this pain. And it was a letter of lament. <clears throat> of commitment and commitment, saying we're going to do something about this. Because I think there are people who are realizing it is now time to stand up. Strap our boots on and get busy. Amen? Because God wants this place to reflect his heart and his passion, his will, his desire. He wants us to live into all that he has for us. And I'm convinced that that that. That, that if I can get people to see things from God's vantage point, things will improve dramatically. So the church, God's devoted followers, the Lord's representatives in the world, we are to be conveyors of God's will. And again, I tell all the people I engage with around this whole race thing, ethnic thing, I promise I will not be mean, brash, harsh, ugly. I'll just be clear and I'll be direct. And I want us to have what they call courageous conversations about the way things have been, not so that people can feel bad, but so that we can change things, amen? So I don't, I don't want to sit around and do nothing. You know, we, we have a problem with not enough people not have enough homes, so we built a little small 61-unit apartment complex our zip code was the unhealthiest zip code in Washington State, so we put together a fitness center, Rainier Health and Fitness. You know, before COVID, we had, what, 1,800 members and a CrossFit deal for about 100 folks who like to really work out. That's the club I'm in, by the way. <laughs> you know, again, I mentioned some of the things we did around education because we believe we can't just commiserate and feel bad, but we've got to do something. So we started volunteering in schools. At one point, we, we ran the after-school program for my wife's K through 8 school. The district paid us to do that. We ran ninth support, ninth, ninth, ninth grade support class for every ninth grader that came into three high schools in our neighborhood. We did homework clubs and centers for three high schools as well because we said, God, we got to do something to help break this, this bad habit that's going on, right? Because we, we, we prayed and then we acted. We prayed and then we acted. We prayed and then we took action. We prayed. And the reason we need to pray because the scripture says, unless the Lord builds a house, the laborer labors in vain. Unless the Lord watches the city, right, the watchman stays awake in vain. And at some point, we got to realize we need God's intervention in this world. Amen? And we need to help usher that in. There's a lot more I can say, but I think I think I'll uh, quit here. 
No, wait, I've got another 45 minutes. Hold on. So the, so the last slide is about the church and society. And I want you to just take a moment right now. And I want you to close your eyes, bow your heart. And I want you to, I want you to grab that thing that God spoke to you. Because I'm convinced that God has said something to you that I have not uttered. Because that's the way the Holy Spirit works, amen? And I want, you to, I want you to start thinking about what it is God may be calling you to be and to do. And, and, and ask God to show me, God, what's my role in, in, in bringing about your plan for where we are planted right now, where we live, where we work, where we play, where we learn. How do we be God's voice and presence? The scripture says in Matthew that he says that we should let our light shine in such a way that when people see our good work, that they would glorify their Father in heaven. And if you do just a cursory study of the Greek you'll discover that there are multiple Greek words for glorify. But the one in that particular verse there is tied to opinion. And what it means in plain English that I should live in such a way that when people see the good that I do, that they would form a right opinion about God, join me, and then glorify God. And what we have the opportunity to do, do is to help people gain the right perspective on who God is. And God knows we need to help because right now there's so many trying to get people to dismiss God, to deny God, to demean God, amen, to discount God. And they're doing it with fraudulent lies, fraudulent lies. And so we have this opportunity to do that. So God, would you speak to us? Speak to us, God. God in heaven, we are grateful today that you love us and you demonstrated that by giving your life for us. And we're grateful, God, that you have invited us to be a part of your plan to redeem this world that's broken. God, help us to latch on to the fact that we are to be conveyors of your vision and your will for this word. God, and then help us to take the appropriate action that gets something changed so that it starts to reflect your heart and your passion more and more and more and more and more. <laughs> God, may we get giddy over the opportunity that you want to use us to bring about change. May the excitement just overwhelm us to think that, what? God would want to include somebody like me to be a part of what he wants done God, give us joy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen? Amen. Let's give God a hand praise, church. Ooh. Thank you, Pastor Harvey, for sharing with us this morning. What a blessing that has been so far. And looking forward to more uh, this afternoon as we continue. Thanks, brother. Thanks, brother. Well, church, we get to respond to God today as we conclude our service. We're going to close that out with a time of just opportunity to give. We get to give of our finances. It's one way that we worship God with our money, and it contributes to the needs of the church and to the ongoing work of the church in the world as we uh, proclaim the gospel and we make disciples. So thank you guys for your faithfulness in that. Uh, but we also get to sing in response. So let's get up on our feet one last time. We're just going to sing a closing song, just solidifying this vision of how, what does it look like for us to be kingdom people living under the lordship of Jesus Christ as the church in this world. So let's sing this out. Bend a knee and your soul. As we are. 
service. We're going to have some leaders up here to pray with you. Also, we want to connect with you. If you're newer to the church, you're not connected to uh, God's people through serving, uh, through participation in community. We want to get you connected to a service team or to a community group or a disciple equip group. So fill out that code on the QR form there, and we would love to get you involved in that way. Also, uh, we're going to have child dedications on Father's Day, so that's a little more than a month out or around a month out, and if you're interested in uh, dedicating your child to the Lord, that would be a time to do that. I don't know if we have a slide for that. It appears as though we don't. don't. Okay, well, we'll get that out to you guys, and you can sign up for that, but be aware. And lastly, 
Uh, Pastor Harvey is going to continue to lead us and help us to really digest some of what he's just unpacked in his message uh, and more. And so you're invited to join us for the Racial Unity Luncheon, which we're going to be doing out in the commons immediately following service. I know many of you haven't yet, uh, uh, what do you call it, registered or RSVP'd for lunch, uh, but it's not too late. We do have a few more slots. We bought a little bit of extra food. And either way, you're welcome to join us. You can go grab some grub and come back, and we'll get started. Uh, but we'd love to see you in there and give you opportunity to just ask the hard questions and to dig into this on a personal level. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have uh, Lauren and Patty Skinner come up for a benediction as we close our service. And now, church family, receive the benediction from Ephesians 3, 20, and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in the grace and peace of Christ this week.